Thanks, Elliot, for sharing with us your gifts this morning and for being available to be used by the Lord. And I get so excited when I think about our younger people and our younger adults who are seeking the Lord and pursuing Him with everything and really wanting to kind of serve. And so it excites me for, uh, to be able to give the, uh, the opportunities to our younger people to do uh, different things like this. And, and I really look forward to the weeks and months and years to come as we lift up our younger people as they, as they lead, lead the church forward. So thanks, thanks again, Elliot. We're, uh, we're starting a sermon series today that I'm calling um, Unmodern Family. And full disclosure, it is a bit of a spoof on the TV show Modern Family, except that for the very few small segments that I've actually seen on the TV ads, I've not actually watched the show. Um, so it's just a spoof on the title and nothing else. I really cannot speak for a whole lot of, of the show itself. Now, I've chosen not to watch it because while the themes within the show are completely consistent with present cultural values and therefore they're widely embraced by, by many, they don't necessarily align with how uh, God has revealed his desire for family within the scriptures. So in many ways, the themes that we're going to be talking about in these weeks together in this sermon series are unmodern. They are rooted within the scriptures. This ancient book, which we embrace as authoritative uh, in all matters and areas of faith and life. But biblical themes on family are not necessarily embraced by the broader culture. For example, um, if you were to um, uh, not support uh, same-sex marriage, somebody might look at you and they would wonder, like, why in the world would you have any issue with two people who truly love each other and who want to build a family? Why would you have an issue with that regardless of their sex? You see, standing for a one-man, one-woman marriage and then the parenting structure that goes with that is unmodern. And yet, it's found embedded in the ancient scriptures. Somebody else might not understand why you believe that it's important uh, for your children to have boundaries and healthy structures. Uh, somebody might say, well, you're going to hinder their self-development. You're preventing them from being all that they can be. Guiding children with healthy boundaries and structures are very unmodern to many and very difficult these days, especially when one considers the challenges that blended families and shared custody brings. When you make a choice to live for Jesus at the center of your home, and you're making decisions based on how he has lived or on what he has said in his word, you are living a life and you are building a family that is very unmodern, and it's going to be very difficult to follow because you are swimming against the strong stream of culture which elevates modern family as the example to follow. So I want to challenge um, each of our families, and even if you're a single person, you are building a family. Uh, so this doesn't just apply to a mom and a dad with kids. Um, a challenge to each of us at the very outset of this teaching series, even as we um, you know, are stuck uh, with our family because of COVID, is to consider how we are building our family. You see, God has a plan for the family, and up against the values of our culture, it's very unmodern. Our enemy, Satan, also has a plan for your family, and that plan is to resist and to push against everything that God has designed. What's your plan for your family, and how are you going to shape it moving forward? And I want to begin uh, today by talking about the power of modeling that parents have on their children. You know, Christian re research uh, that's been done has asked the question, who or what has the greatest influence on your child? And the consistent findings rank a mother as number one and a father as number two. Now, I realize that there are other elements <clears throat> like TV, 
like technology, friendships, uh, Sunday school or youth group, all those things also can have an influence and, and often a significant influence on a child's life. But what this research suggests is that of everything that could be influential, a mother and a father have the greatest capacity to influence a child. And I guess one then could also say that a mom and dad have the greatest influence and capacity to, uh, to steer their child in, in all kinds of directions, whether those directions are good or bad, positive, negative, uh, guiding a child towards Jesus or away from him, uh, steering them towards a modern family value system or, or unmodern family values. Now, the research also suggests that a mom and a dad living out their faith in their family, albeit imperfectly, are still two to three times more influential in making disciples of their children than any formal program or ministry that the church has to offer. So think about that in terms of our current COVID situation. Do you think that a 30-minute kids lesson on Sunday morning or a one-hour Zoom call with the youth group on Wednesday or Thursday, or even on a sermon like today for 30 or 40 minutes, is going to address everything that our kids or we need to see and hear and learn and live out? No. It's, it's going to be a support, and, and it's going to be a needed support, but it's just a fraction of what we need to grow as disciples of Jesus. A child needs a parent's full engagement. And I'm so grateful for my own wife, Leanne, in this regard, because even now with, um, with this situation that we find ourselves in where we're, we're at home, two older teenagers and a young adult, um, there, is, there is structure, there is, there is order um, Leanne has breakfast uh, with the kids every day at a certain time. I'm, I'm out of the house already by that time, but she has breakfast and they have a Bible study. They're studying through the book of Titus right now. It's not perfect. Our kids aren't perfect. Their parents aren't perfect. But her full engagement with our children in this stage of their life and in this season that we find ourselves in is huge. Um, Christian Smith, uh, uh, a sociologist, um, has done a lot of writing, and, and he said that most teenagers and their parents may not realize it, but a lot of research in the sociology of religion suggests that the most important social influence in shaping young people's religious lives is the religious life modeled and taught to them by their parents. So when we talk about modeling the question is not whether we are doing it or not. The question is, what are we modeling? And is it intentional? So our text this morning is from Psalm 127. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn there with me because that's where we're going to be focusing the rest of our time. And I want to read this short psalm together, five verses. So wherever, wherever you're sitting, um, in your living room, in your kitchen, by your computer, by your TV, I'd like you to read together along with me and with your spouse or with your children um, as a family these words from Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them, they will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. May the Lord bless the corporate reading of his word. Now in your Bibles, you may have a little note under uh, the title of Psalm 127, which says, A Song of Ascents. Now do you know what that means? Psalm 127 is, is generally understood as being written by King Solomon, this wealthy and wise leader of Israel. 
And it's one of a handful of psalms that would have been very meaningful for Jewish people who had been exiled out of their homeland when they were taken into captivity, but then who had been released from their exile, and now they were pilgrims on a journey back to Jerusalem, their their home country. So as they were traveling up back to Jerusalem together with their, their family and their clans, they would have recited and sang and prayed these psalms, helping them to remember. And as they remembered, they modeled to their children what was really important in life. And in short, this psalm um, helps, um, helps us see several very, very significant areas Uh, that we can model to our children, but quite frankly, they're very challenging, especially in this season that we find ourselves in where some cracks are beginning to show. I realize that not every family is experiencing this, but there are a good number of families where where the cracks are starting to show. And I'm going to frame these two very, very significant areas in the form of two questions. And I I would like our parents to discuss these two areas in the coming week. If you're a single parent and you are uncertain who you can discuss this with, it's going to be more challenging. But I have a suggestion. If you email me, I will seek to pair you up with another parent or or parents who are willing and seeking to talk with somebody also. Another option is for you to use the live chat option even this morning and ask if there is somebody willing to come alongside and discuss these two questions with you. The first question is this, coming from Psalm 127. Who or what is really building your home? Who or what is really building your home? Look at verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house. Now remember who the folks are that originally sang and prayed this song. They have been in exile. For years, they have very little, materially speaking. But the one thing that they did have as they made their way back to their homeland was the Lord, who had carried them, who had sustained them through their time of challenge. And they're now singing about it. They're praying about it. They're reciting it together as a family. My guess is that they needed to answer some tough questions that their kids had about their journey and the challenges. My guess is that they wrestled with faith issues. But as they journeyed together, they could say in confidence that the Lord, their God, was the one who had carried them and was the one who was building their family. And without Him, it was all in vain, and they would have nothing. That is such an unmodern way of thinking. To have the Lord be the master planner and builder of your home, to have him set the agenda and the direction for your marriage and your family, your children and your life choices, for far too many, that is absolute crazy talk. Um, We we don't necessarily follow this kind of pattern. Far too often, don't we let our work interests or our kids' interests or our salary and income, or our recreational choices, or our desire to be accepted by our spouse, or or maybe even our kids, set the direction and the master plan for our families and and home life. That's the modern way of life, and that's the modern family value system. And you know what? Even Christian families can buy into this modern mindset, and they can't imagine giving up a year of their lives to serve together with their children in a third world country. Too risky. Too expensive. It's going to hinder my retirement plans. I I can't have my kids give up their musical and sporting endeavors. Why would I do that? And yet when we think like that and we live like that, Don't for a moment think that we are not modeling to our kids. We are. 
we're modeling actually that we are the ones who ultimately call the shots based on our perception on economics and security and comfort. We're modeling that those things are the most important things over what God might want to do in our life and how he may want to build and shape our family. So parents, our role in modeling to our children God's agenda as opposed to something else is so huge. And the assumption of the psalmist and the activity of the Jewish family traveling back to Jerusalem demonstrates that that the Lord was present, that the Lord was active, very central among them, calling the shots. These were not empty songs and and prayers that were being sung and prayed uh, by families who occasionally included the Lord in their lives. These families meant what they said because they lived it. So here's the application. You cannot shape your child's life spiritually if the Lord is not central in your own. You can't expect your child to read their Bible or or to pray if you're not doing it. Do do your kids see you? Do they witness you uh, at home reading the Bible, um, asking faith questions around the dinner table, uh, praying, uh, yes, with them, yes, with the family, but but also on, on your own? Do they see you journaling about about the faith issues that you're, you're working through and the, and the Bible studies that you might be, be working at? Um, do they see you doing it? And not just the pastor, not just the, the spiritual person in your life. W- what do they witness as um, you steward your resources? Um, your kids, my kids, are going to take their cues from how we live. They're going to see what's valuable in our lives by what we value. Our our oldest daughter, she purchased her her first um, car this past week with money that she had had earned and and been saving up for the last number of years. And she had set it aside and and she got some great shopping help from from Ken Gagnon. Thanks, Ken. You You are awesome. We love you dearly. It's, it's an older Honda Civic, and it's got a five-speed manual transmission. And when I saw that thing, I was like, wow, this reminds me of my 1978 Toyota Celica, and, and, I, and I really wanted to go back and, and get that car again. But, but Adriana, she has never uh, driven a stick before. So, so when we bought the car, I took Adriana to uh, that big parking lot that everybody takes their kids to, uh, the CN parking lot, to, to practice for the first time how to drive a manual transmission. And before we started, I, I said to her, I said, Adriana, uh, remember the first thing that we ever did in the car when I started to teach you how to drive when you turned 16. And she paused for a moment, and then she said, yeah, uh, we prayed. And I said, that's right. <laughs> and now we need to, we need to pray again. <laughs> and so we prayed. <laughs> we prayed, Lord, help Adriana with this new challenge, and Lord, help this transmission survive, because it's not going to be pretty. But seriously, I want my kids to be kids who build their lives on the Lord, who run to Him for everything, even to guide them in something new and scary like driving a standard transmission. Because unless the Lord builds the house, we're building in vain. So I need to model a life that helps them see it. Parents, will you make your family a a place where Jesus is real and he is the Lord over all aspects of your life? Decisions about parenting, decisions about marriage, decisions about recreation choices and financial spending, vocational questions, sports and music questions, church engagement, where everything 
in your life is built not on what others are saying or doing, but on what the Lord is guiding you to do based on his word and by the guidance of his Holy Spirit. Who is really building your home? That is the first question that I want you to wrestle with as you think about this psalm. The second question is this, who really is your provider and protector? Back to the text. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Many of us can relate to what I'm about to say. Until eight weeks ago, many of us were really busy people. We were running businesses. We were leading organizations. We were trying to manage people. We're providing for our families. We're enjoying recreation um, wherever we wanted to go, fly, drive. We're running our kids and our grandkids from one activity to the other. Oh, life is full, maybe even enjoyable. For some, it's super addicting. And you know what? The Bible calls us to be, to be busy, to be, to be full in a good sense, to, to work hard, to provide for our families, to be skillful. But look at what the psalmist says. In vain, you rise early and you stay up late toiling for food to eat. Do you know, this would have been really meaningful. This would have actually meant something to the Jewish pilgrims because they had everything taken from them and they were exiled to another land. They had to place their trust fully in the Lord to lead them, to guide them, care for them, provide for them, and sustain them. For every piece of food they ate, for every hour of work they were given, every bit of sleep they enjoyed. And as they sang this psalm and prayed this psalm, I can only imagine what kind of gratitude they felt knowing that the Lord was capable of providing for them and protecting them all through the years, even the challenging ones. You know, perhaps this season that we're currently in is forcing us to rethink our own perspective. Because for many we've been lulled into thinking that we're the ones who provide for our families. We're the ones who protect our children and our family livelihood in our home. Our needs and our provisions have become assumed. Our experience is not like the Jewish pilgrims. We're actually cared for quite well. When our cupboards are bare, we've come to understand that the grocery store or the food bank is our provider. When the gas tank reads empty, we fill it up. When our kids ask for money, or some clothing, or a toy, we go to the store and, and we buy it for them. And they come to believe that mom and dad are their ultimate provider. Our, our jobs and our income, and our hard work, and, and maybe even the government right now, that enables stability and security, and, and they've become our provision and our protection until things change. And Psalm 127 actually calls the family to reorder their thinking. Who really is it that provides for our daily needs? Who really does watch over our children? Who is it that calms our emotional anxiety and fears that many people are experiencing? Who gives us the rest for our body and our soul? Jesus one day, in teaching his disciples, took them out into a, into a field and and I, and I love the imagery because I love walking through grain fields and canola fields. And so I, I can imagine what it might have looked like. And, and, and Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. 
Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? L- look, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not so much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? For some people, they need to hear these words of comfort and truth from Jesus, the one that we're saying we want to build our lives on. When we find ourselves driven by unreasonable expectations to provide according to modern family values, or when we find ourselves crippled by fear to protect our kids from every uh, possible challenge that might lie ahead on their life's journey, we can be certain that we are, we're off the mark and we need to recalibrate. Because the psalmist says that the Lord is our ultimate provider and protector. Jesus says that we have a heavenly Father who cares for us deeply, more than we could ever imagine. Parents, what are we modeling to our children in this regard? Who is the provider? Who is the protector in your home? You know, I still remember uh, the sunny summer day in the 1980s when I was a teenager and I was outside uh, mowing our our lawn and an unmarked RCMP officer uh, found its way onto our property and so I I turned the garden tractor off as they wanted to um, talk with someone and they were wondering if this was the home of Peter and Mary Dick. Well, it was. And so they asked if they could, could see them, if they could talk to them. It was early afternoon, I still remember that, and my parents were both sleeping, so I had to wake them up. Now, it wasn't that my parents were sloths or lazy, if that's what you're wondering. No, my parents actually worked uh, both uh, full-time, and they were both working night shifts, uh, trying to make the best of things in very difficult economic times. It was the 1980s. It was a decade when interest rates were a whole lot higher than they are now. And it was uh, the decade where uh, my dad's uh, employment uh, got shifted uh, dramatically downward and for the rest of his working life uh, really challenged his capacity to, to, to provide, to earn the kind of salary that most uh, men are used to for their family. There was four teenagers in the house at that time. So to try and increase our family's uh, revenue, my parents had started this small business venture with, with vending machines that have these mechanical cranes in them that can scoop up a stuffed animal when you, when you plug in a quarter to the machine. So they were probably several months into this venture when when the cops arrived. Uh, My parents had not entered into this business lightly. They had done their homework. They had worked with a lawyer on it. They had invested whatever little money they had, and then they launched it. And the quarters started piling up, and I still remember the ice cream buckets of quarters that my parents would bring home after they would do a round of of checking in on the machines as people played them. Now, there was just one small problem that surfaced with the arrival of these police officers in our yard. The the business venture was an American franchise, and, and playing these machines was perfectly legal south of the border. But, but plugging a quarter in these machines gave no guarantee that you were actually going to get a stuffed toy. You might get one or you might not. And in Canada, it was against the law to not be guaranteed a toy if you put a quarter in the machine. In other words, it was a form of gambling that was illegal in Canada, but totally legal in the United States. So in simple terms, my parents, 
who were faithful deacons in our church had now become the Manitoba Mennonite Mafia, and the RCMP had been hot on their tail for months trying to track them down. So whatever my parents had invested, taking from their meager means in difficult times, totally vanished. Wiped, wiped off the table. Our garage became a warehouse for a truckload of vending machines filled with stuff stuffed toys that would only gather dust. No one's going to buy a business that's illegal to operate. And I'm sure that my parents were super disappointed and frustrated as they worked with the RCMP and the lawyer who had approved the deal and the legal process that ensued over the following months. But you know what? All I saw as a teenager preparing to begin college for which my parents were sacrificing uh, was humility and grace and trust in the Lord as they patiently worked through a process which only lost the money that they could not afford to lose and sleep which was already in short supply. I will always remember that as a teenager about to be launched from my family home. The power of influence that our parents have in our lives to model that which is of the Lord or that which is not is so great. So after, after the COVID layoff, after the unexpected health diagnosis, with a challenged marriage or a, a custody battle for your children, with economics that leave you in a bind, with hopes and, and dreams for a future, for your kid's future, placed on pause. What are you modeling for your kids? What are you modeling within your family? See, how we respond in the adversities in life shape and inform our child's view of God and of others of conflict, of suffering and trials and hardship. And Jesus, Jesus even compares two homes in Matthew chapter 7. It's like two families. When he speaks about building your life on solid ground or on shifting sand. And he says that as long as life is going well, you may not actually observe any difference between the two. But when the storms of life hit, when adversity comes your way, and it will, you begin to see the cracks in the foundation. One home has the capacity to stand firm while the other disintegrates under the stress of the storm. The power of modeling. I'd like to speak for a moment to those whose children are already grown up or who live under your roof maybe, but, but your influence with them is, is different or it's not the same as it once was. Perhaps you've experienced successful application of Psalm 127 and perhaps not. I want you to understand that the journey is not over. It's true, your influence may be limited or different than it once was, but will you continue to be there for your children and your grandkids? If there have been challenges in the past, I can guarantee you that nagging and criticism and pressure isn't likely going to help at this point. But, but do keep your home open to them. You can continue to model for them what a life looks like following Jesus. You can pray for them. You can be available for them. Hopefully, you can still provide child care or, or help with your, with your grandkids and be godly influences and, and models to them. You can be a mentor, even to someone else within our own church family who is looking for, for uh, one who's been down the track a little further and, and who's, who knows maybe what's coming and can speak into your life. If your children have turned away or turned from the faith, keep the door open. Don't close it. Don't shut them out of your life just because you're discouraged because of some of the life choices that they've made. Continue to love them. Include them. Pray for them. And leave them in the Lord's capable hands 
Because the journey is not over. God's not done with them, and God's not done with you just yet. What's from stopping you today? Even if you're thinking, well, I haven't really been doing some of these things that we've been talking about. What's preventing you from beginning today to start a new pathway for your marriage, for your family, for your kids? Let me close, let me close with uh, uh, a line from Gary Thomas in his book, Sacred Parenting. Gary writes, We can't avoid leaving ruts. To have a child is to influence another life, perhaps even several generations. The only question is in what direction will our ruts carry our children? So I'd like you to think about this psalm this coming week. And and again, I'd like you to talk about it and pray about it with your spouse, if you're married, and and with your children. Include them in, in the conversation and ask several questions. Um, Do we have a plan for our family that's built on the Lord? That's the first question. The second question, what values are we modeling in our home? And then the third question, is the Holy Spirit nudging us based on what we've been talking about even this morning? Is he nudging us uh, to do something about something that needs to change? And together as a family, Uh, Would you commit yourselves to to starting fresh and to to building a family where Jesus is at the center, where the Lord is truly building your life? I'd like to pray with us, and uh, and then we'll be dismissed. Um, So Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Uh, Again, just thank you for the opportunity to celebrate communion, to remember what you've done for us, and to remember that you are very much at the center of our church family, even in this season. And we're seeing it in so many different ways. And so today, Lord, would you um, encourage and challenge us to, to, to be moved by your word, to be moved by your spirit, to start to take steps in a direction that um, increasingly um, evidence this truth that you are the one building our home. We ask for your strength and your help in this, and we pray your great encouragement on each one today. And so we ask these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. Well, I truly hope that you will have a wonderful day and an awesome week ahead. May you experience God's blessing um, as you walk with him and as you start this journey together. Have a great week.